It's top of the bill time, folks. I've only got one thing to say to you. Would you welcome on stage, Mr. Mike Reed? Jesus Christ. It's like a bleeding Jewish lighthouse in here, isn't it? Shut up, Trappy. You want to see the dressing room they're given? There's a notice on the door, said beware of poofs. <laughs> there was a notice on the mirror, said beware of poofs. There was a message on the floor. I bent down to look at it. It said, you've been warned twice. <laughs> also heard on the car radio on the way up here, the police just raided a poof club in London. <laughs> Didn't nick anybody, got 30 bob each for their truncheons. <laughs> Blind fella walked into a shop with his guide dog. He picked the guide dog up by the towel and he started to sling it round his head. Wee! Manager come over, is it gonna help us? No, he's not, I'm just looking around. <laughs> <laughs> and when he went outside, this dog has cocked his leg and had a Fraser all down his trousers. Fraser Nash all down his stride, see? He put his hand in his pocket and was giving his dog a biscuit. I said, turn it in, Winkle. Dog's just said, a wee down your leg, you're giving it a biscuit. He says, yeah, no, 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 its mouth is, I'm gonna kick it up the arse. <laughs> Two fellas walking along a bank of an African river and on the side of this bank of the river, there was this big crocodile stuck out like that with its mouth open and this black head sticking out. One fella said to the other one, look at that flash bastard. He said, I only got a Lacoste sleeping bag. I <laughs> 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 I was standing outside just now, one of them big Doberman dogs jumped to my leg and started to go, wee. I said, get off, he went, Arr. I said, well, hurry up then. <laughs> do, you, do you know why women wipe their eyes when they wake up in the morning? It's because they ain't got a pair of balls to scratch. I've had some bloody aggravation this week, look. I'm laying in bed with the old woman last night, three o'clock in the morning, she sat bolt upright and said, quick, my husband's coming. And like a bloody idiot, I jumped out the window. <laughs> this morning I took my car into a Jewish garage and said, Simonize it. <laughs> I cut two inches off the exhaust pipe. I've come out of the house tonight, I'm coming along the blood. I've gone two miles from my house, it's pouring down with rain. There he was in the middle of the road, a copper, like that. But you know when it's raining, you've got to wait for that windscreen wiper to come back to make sure, haven't you? There he was, bold as brass. I thought, he's never going to be strong enough, you know. <laughs> Is it the bonnet? He's bounced off the windscreen, he's laying in the road, the rain's running in his face. He looked up at me, he said, you're a silly boy, aren't you? I said, I ain't laying out there in the pissing rain, am I? <laughs> He said, I'm going to give you a ticket. I said, what's that for? Some sort of raffle. <laughs> he said, if you like, some three of those and you can get yourself a bike. <laughs> he said, is this your car? I said, no, it belongs to my mate, Tommy O. He said, what sort of a car was that? I said, a Vauxhall. He said, where you been to? I said, Mildenhall. He said, where you going? I said, Southall. He said, what you got in the boot? I went, find out for yourself. <laughs> I don't know. Motor car broke down. I got a bleeding thumb, a lift, a little bit of mist and fog about. All of a sudden, out the fog, up pulled a motor. I thought, Mike and my son, that will do you. I've got in his motor, leaned over, close the door. As I close the door, the motor's moved off. I've looked over the wall to driver. There ain't no driver. <laughs> motor's going along the road, there's no one at the wheel. All of a sudden, a bend appeared in the road. I thought, how are we going to get round there? Here? As I'm thinking that, a pair of ghostly hands appeared at the wheel and began to steer the motor around the corner. I thought, that's my luck. I left that seat in a mess. Ooh. I got outside, there's another fella standing there. I said, I'm getting here, mate, there's something wrong with that. He said, you're telling me I've been pushing that bastard five miles. <laughs> so I wound up getting a train here. Got off the station, I said to the station master, anything exciting to do round here, mate? He said, where are you going? I said, the Willows. He said, stay here and watch some shunting. <laughs> I got a cab here. It was one of those lady cab drivers. I said, I understand in this particular area, there are one or two houses of ill repute. She said, there are. I said, take it to one. I said, what one? I said, the cheapest. <laughs> she said, you're in it. 
We've got round to this place, the madam's opened up the door, there's a fella standing there. He says, what do you want? He said, I want a woman. <laughs> said, behave yourself, you've got no arms and no legs. He said, I rung the bell, didn't I? <laughs> they even had a blind prostitute there. Jesus Christ, you've got to hand it to her. <laughs> Listen, listen, listen. I've got her a bit earlier, fancy something to eat. I've got this little restaurant, there's only one fella in the place behind the counter. I said, evening. He said, yes, sir, can I help you? He said, get some brandy, son. He said, certainly, sir. I said, how much is that? He said, a penny. I said, a penny? Make it a large one. I said, don't I do a nice, thick, juicy T-bone steak with French fried potatoes, French fried onions, and an egg sunny side up, do you? He said, certainly, sir, but that comes to money. I said, how much? He said, four pence. I said, four pence? Who owns this place? He said, a geezer named Will Wright. I said, where's he then? He said, upstairs with my missus. <laughs> I said, what's he doing upstairs with your missus? He said, same as I'm doing down here with his business. <laughs> anyway. And he get out for half hour. Get away from my old woman. Cool, that is one ugly cow, that is. Oh, I normally bring her with me. You know, it saves kissing her goodbye. I met my old woman years ago at a dance. She looked lovely in a sequin balaclava. <laughs> I decided to take her home to meet my dad, but at the time I never had a car. She had a car. We're driving on the road. She's doing 40 miles an hour, cutting walls a set of red lights. I went, slow down, go, the lights are red. She went straight for these red lights. I went, ooh. What do you drive like that for? I said, always drive like that. I said, who taught you to drive? I said, my brother. I said, he must be out of his bloody brains. We're coming up with another set of red lights. I went, slow down, girl, the lights are red. She went straight through those. I went, Ooh. I said, your brother must be crazy to teach you to drive like that. All of a sudden, we come up with a set of green lights. I thought, thank God for that. We've got right on top of them. She's put her foot on the anchors. And I think my biscuit on the dashboard. Crunch. I said, what did you stop for? I said, my brother might be coming the other way. I thought. <laughs> Got round my house, my old man said to me, Jesus Christ, son, she's ugly, isn't she? I said, there's no need to whisper, Dad, she's deaf. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm lucky to get her, she's one of a set of twins. He said, how do you recognise her? I said, her brother's bald. <laughs> what an handful that is. 17 years old when I got married, that ain't a gag, that's a fact. 17 years old, you're not exactly bursting with old levels at 17, are you? But I did my best. We drove over to Paris. We found this little honeymoon hotel. I've gone upstairs to the bedroom with the old woman. I've tapped the bedroom door up, took my trousers off, threw them on the bed. I said to my missus, put the trousers on. I said, what? I said, put the trousers on. I said, what? I said, put the bloody trousers on, will you? She went, all right, trappy, all right. She got me strides and I said, listen, because I'm only going to tell you this once. That is the first and the last time you wear the trousers in this house. She said, please yourself. She took my trousers off and took her knickers off and threw them at me. She said, put them on. I said, never believe you can get into them. She said, no, until you change your attitude, cocky, you won't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. I did my best. 17 years old, I left her in the bedroom to put a bit of onky on a bit of paint. I went downstairs for a nightcap. I said, evening, barman. He said, yes, sir, can I help you? He said, give us a pint a bit or something. He said, excuse me, sir, it occurs to me you're a newly wed couple, is that correct? I said, yeah. He said, under no circumstances whatsoever, drink bitter. It shrivels it up. <laughs> what you want is a large brandy. Make you like a bleeding lion. I said, give us a large brandy, Winkle. Wallop. I went away, I'll come back an hour later. Barman, terrific, terrific. Give us another large brandy. And a pint of bitter for the wife. <laughs> It was like throwing a woodbine in the Albert Hall. It was cool. <laughs> <laughs> She's all right. I've been with the same lady 30 years now. I ain't liable to change, I suppose. I look around the business. All my mates getting married and new young wives. Des O'Connor got a young wife. Bruce Falls, I've got a young wife. I've got a young girl in the bed now. I don't think I know what to bleed and do with it. <laughs> Be like playing snooker with a bit of rope, you know what I mean? <laughs> I this, here it is. I played golf with a wife the other day. We got back in the clubhouse a bit earlier. The steward said to me, morning, Mr. Reed." I said, hello, Tom, how are you, son? He said, I'm fine, sir. He said, excuse me, sir, you've got a seven iron wrapped round your neck. 
Yeah, so I was playing golf with the wife this morning, so we got on the fourth tee. We both had our drives up the fairway. As you know, it's a blind shot to the green. I took a five iron, the wife took a seven iron. We walked up the green, I found my ball on the green, but we couldn't find the wife's ball anywhere. But I noticed there was a cow standing on the side of the fairway. So I walked across to this cow, and I lifted up this cow's towel, and there was my wife's ball sitting there like that, all snuggly poozy woozy. I said, here you are, dear, this looks like yours, and she hit me with a seven iron. <laughs> Uh, no, no, it's not that long. No, no, no. The only thing I don't like about marriage, and it's ridiculous when you think of it, because I'm one myself at in laws. My mother in law is an 18 carat, 100% rat bag. She weighs 28 stone. No matter where you're sitting in the room, she's sitting next to you. Ooh. And she wears them big elastic knickers. We were going through the woods the other day, the elastic in a knicker broke. Brought down four trees. <laughs> she hung her knickers on the line to dry and a family of gypsies moved in. <laughs> Look at horse. Big. She's massive. First time my father and I went to give her one, he climbed on top of her and burnt his ass on the light bulb. <laughs> oh. Having said that, he's just as bleeding bad. My old father in all thick as two planks he is. He's a long distance lorry driver on the Isle of Wight. <laughs> I went round his house the other day, I said, Jesus Christ, Dad, your ceilings are high, aren't they? He said, yeah, your mother wanted two rooms knocked into one. While I was round, there was a knock at the door. The old boy opened up the door. There's a fella standing there. He said to my father-in-law, I'm from the double glazing people, mate. You've had it eight months now. You ain't paid a penny piece yet. My father-in-law said, you told me it'll pay for itself within a year. <laughs> thick. Absolutely thick. Little boy and a little girl were sitting in the bath. The little girl said to the little boy, what's that? He said, it's mine. She said, can I play with it? He said, leave me out, you broke yours off. <laughs> he said, I'm gonna duck you. She said, you can't even say it. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody kids. Father Christmas came down the chimney to a tiny little bedroom. In the middle of this bedroom, there's a beautiful young girl standing there with a negligee on. Father Christmas went, ho, ho, ho. She said, do you want to stop the 10 minutes, Father Christmas? He said, leave me out, I ain't got time for that bloody nonsense. I've got to go all over Europe. She said, never mind about that. She got a finger and a thumb, undone this bow with this little blouse, and it fell away. Oh, fellas, Jesus Christ. She had nipples like Rolls Royce wheel nuts. <laughs> Five of them. <laughs> Father Christmas and now bleeding, turning, and he said, I told you once, I've got to go all over Europe. She said, never mind about that. She got her thumbs in the little panties and pulled them down over this lovely rounded bum. Father Christmas said, you bleeding rat bag. I gotta stay now, I can't get back up that bloody chimney. <laughs> Little boy come running open school, he went straight up to his mum and dad's bedroom, his mum and dad on the bed, dad's giving mum one. <laughs> he said, mum, what are you doing? He said, I'm playing crib, your father's with partner, get out in the kitchen. He's gone down there, through the kitchen, into the lounge, in the lounge, there's his sister with her boyfriend on the couch. Her legs are quarter past nine, Tony's bum is a blur. <laughs> he says, sister, what are you doing? He said, I'm playing crib. Told you to be partner, get out in the garden. He rushed straight into the garden, into the gardening shed. In the gardening shed, there's his old granddad flogging his oris. <laughs> <laughs> he said, granddad, what are you doing? He said, I'm playing crib. He said, where's your partner? He said, when you've got a good hand, you don't need a partner. <laughs> And the way they change, always do me up. I don't know why, if only parents can understand this. In a period of all oh, six months, they change from young kids to bleeding young adults. And it, the mental thing, 15 year old boy started working a chemist. The boy's very first job out of school, and naturally enough, the kid was nervous, and the chemist stuck him straight on the counter. And as he's standing there, this young girl come in, she said, good morning. He said, morning, miss. She said, um, can I have a packet of Tampax, please? The kid went, ah. <laughs> He runs straight back in the shop. The chemist said, what's wrong with you? He said, there's a woman out there. Want some tan packs? He said, son, it's a chemist. Go and serve her, for Christ's sake. 
A week later, the kid's getting used to the job and the same woman come in. I said, morning, another packet of cotton wool, please. Oh, he said, you're rolling your own now. <laughs> <laughs> True story. This how it is. A little bit of, little bit of geography first. The nearest place to an East End Londoner for a bit of beach and seaside is a place called South End. Now, this is a true story. A mate of mine said to his mate boy years ago, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, son. I'm going to take you down to South End for the day, but not like we do nowadays in the car, like we did in the old days on the Chuff Chuff. Go, he said, you mean it, then? He said, I do, boy. They got on the Chuff Chuff, they've gone down to South End, they're walking on the beach, and the boy said, here, Dad, can I have an ice cream, Dad? Can I, 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 Dad? Can I he said, hang on, boy. You can have an ice cream, son, but don't go running away with yourself because you just got off the chuff chuff. There's the ice cream. Cool, he said, thanks, Dad. It's all running down his shirt. It's stuck up his hooter. Fifteen minutes later, there's another sign there. Rocks. Cool, Dad, he said, can I have a rock, Dad? Can I, Dad? Can I, Dad? He said, hang on, boy, hang on. He said, look, you can have a rock, son, but you just got off the chuff chuff in ice cream. There's your rock. Oh, he said, thanks, Dad. It's all crumbling down his strides. His lips are stuck together. An hour and a half later, there's another sign there. Donkey rides. Go, he said, can I have a donkey ride, Dad? Can I have that? He said, hang on, boy, and just hang on it. He said, look, you've had a ride down on the chuff chuck and an ice cream with a stick of rock, now you want a donkey ride. He said, I want a donkey ride, Dad. He said, get on the bleeding donkey. Get on the bloody thing. He's on this donkey, he's just coming off. There's another sign there. These donkeys are for sale. Oh, he said, buy me the donkey, buy me the donkey, buy me. He said, what do you mean by a bloody donkey? You've had a ride down the chuff chuff, ice cream, stick a rock, donkey ride, now you want me to buy the donkey? He said, buy me the donkey, Dad. He said, I'll buy you the bloody thing. They got the donkey on the box car on the train going home. He said, what are you going to call it, son? He said, Dad, I'm going to call it Tosser. He said, what? Tosser? You've had a ride down on the chuff chuff, ice cream, stick a rock, donkey ride, now that you want me to call it Tosser? He said, I want to call it Tosser, Dad. He said, call it much a bleeding like. They got it back to the house. He said, where are you going to keep it, son? He said, Dad, I'm going to keep it in my bedroom. He said, with the bleeding edge up you are. What are you on about? You had a ride down the chuff chuff, ice cream, stick a rock, donkey ride, bought to the donkey, you've called it Tosser. There's no way you're going to keep it in the bedroom. He said, where can I keep it, Dad? He said, don't worry, son, I'll build you a shed. The old man went outside, built this great big shed, put the donkey in it. That night, there was a thunderstorm, and the lightning went fur, lop, and the thunder went kerh, runch. The donkey went bez work, wallop, over's gone the shed, and he's had it across the Field. Now, the boy has seen this. He's running to his dad's bedroom. He said, Dad, Dad, toss us off. He said, Now, behave yourself, son. You've got a right to the chapter. Oh, I still a stick. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Picture the scene. A very busy pub, but there's one chair vacant at a table. The fellow walks in. He said, you might want to sit down, mate. He said, sit down, my old son, help yourself. He said, thanks very much. Would you like a drink? He said, you haven't got to buy me a drink because I told you to sit down. He said, I want to buy you a drink, son. He bought him a drink. He bought him one back. 11 o'clock, these two are smashed out of their brains. The one that was originally there turned around to his newfound friend. He said, have you got a car? He said, yeah, he said, well, let's go around my house for a nightcap. Come on, come on. He got up, he walked two paces, he fell over right on his ear hole. Wallop! And it's come near, frobo, frobo. His mate went to help him. He said, bloody well, leave me alone. Come on, come on. He's gone another two steps, he fell over on his chin. Spank! Yard and half, yard and half, yard and half chin. <laughs> his mate said, I have the sneaking suspicion, you're drunk. He said, I'm not bloody well drunk. Where's the car? They got to the car, opened up the car door, the door's hit him right in the mouth. But losh, his railings have gone all up and down the gutter. There's blood rushing down his gums. His mate says, you are drunk. He said, I'm not bloody well drunk. Drive the car. They got round to his house, he opened up the car door, he fell out on his nose. Spink! It wound up round there. There's blood running down his back. He's found the gutter. Bosh, that leg's got Roberton into a lamppost. Zip, all these ribs have gone. This lip's flapping about in the wind. His mate said, you're far too drunk. He said, I'll ring the bell and your wife can put you to bed and I'll see you tomorrow. State of this geezer the following morning. All his clobbers hanging in rags. He's covered from head to foot in dry claret. His wife said, are you all right, love? Oh, uh, all right. He said, I must have got drunk last night. She said, drunk? Drunk? He was pissing out your brains. You come home without your wheelchair. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't start to it. Warm here, it. Jesus. It's like bleeding summertime, isn't it? I would imagine it's been a long time since I've been to Manchester. Oh, 
I should live up here for a long time and I'll have some wonderful some wonderful signs up here. And um, I suppose it must be very obvious, you ladies and gentlemen listen to me talk. There may be like some people here tonight. I come a working class family. I was born in the east end of London, raised up around there by my own nan and granddad. I like nowadays there weren't bunches of money about. Mum and Dad used to get all our clothes from the XWD department. Oh Christ. That was embarrassing going to school dressed as a Japanese admiral. <laughs> my sister was a Gurkha. <laughs> And my old nan was a big, fat, regal East End lady with a lovely sense of humour, generous to a fault. And my old granddad, he was an ex-docker. <laughs> Lazy old son he was. His mate said to him one day, yeah, original the daffodils are out. He said, will that affect us? <laughs> and down the docks, whether you know it or not, all dockers have got nicknames. My granddad's nickname was Diesel. Because every time he opened up a case, he used to go, Diesel do for the kids. <laughs> Characters then. I don't know about Manchester, but I know, it, I know them old East End times were no bloody good at all. I remember sitting down listening to my nan and granddad talk about the good old days. But when you get older and you start to analyse that, what the bloody hell was good about them old days? Especially the women, prisoners in their own home, locked away indoors, only ironing, shopping, looking after the kids, never allowed out the house. The old man, on the other hand, always in the boozer, lunchtime, nighttime, never out of a pub. My granddad's come out of a pub one lunchtime. He's taken a shortcut through the graveyard. He's so drunk, he's fell in an open grave. There he is for the next half hour. Help! I'm cold, I'm cold. Another drunk come by. I said, of course you're bloody well cold. They haven't covered you up, you see. <laughs> Characters. My nan was lovely. My, she was never allowed out of the house. My old granddad was always in a boozer. Week in, week out. His mate sent him one day. He said, Charlie, he said, when you make love to your wife, do you kiss her all over? Christ, I bloody don't do that. Now, sod that, mate, don't do that. He said, you want to try it, pal, and I'll get him at it. My granddad's gone home that night. There's my nan laying in bed in all her feminine glory. Pound of spanners in her ear. <laughs> Back's gone the blanket. She's laying there with nothing on. You know, one boob under each arm. <laughs> my granddad, for where bloody well goes. <laughs> He's kissed her right on the forehead, on each eyelid, on the end of the bugle and on the chin. She ain't moved. If all the lions saw it ain't working. He kissed on each shoulder blade, on the end of the boobs, that automatically went... <laughs> he kissed her on her belly button and from her belly button he went straight to her kneecap. <laughs> My nan opened up one eye and said, that would believe been a pub, you wouldn't have passed it, would you? <laughs> you know, I was coming here tonight and it's often... Happens to each and every one of us, whether you be male or female. You go over your lifetime, your relationships, your friendships, your business, and it. And I was coming out and I was thinking about the business that I've been in for a long, long time now. And I've been very lucky, and I don't say that to be Jack the Lad or facetious or anything like that. I've done a lot of things. I've done the comedians with Johnny Ant many years ago, and things started to go up near. I had my own situation comedies and my own shows. And I'm an East Enders now. I've got one burning ambition in this life, just one I've got. I want to go on the Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> And I want to say to some grey-haired old woman, do you know what that's worth, darling? Fuck all. <laughs> I, uh, unbelievable. All those wonderful experts sit there and tell them what it's all about. They don't want to know. You can see it in their eyes. How much? <laughs> God, I know. Arthur Scargill's just got in the hospital for a circumcision operation. The surgeon said, I can't operate this man. There's no end to this dick. It's a game with him, isn't it? And we're all human beings. I'll tell you what. I, stu I study human beings. I make a study. You're sitting there, you know, in a tube and you're down in the end of smoke, we're on a bus. And I go over people and look at people and try to analyse them. And the amazing thing about it, we're all so different. Different things turn us on, turn us off, make us laugh, make us cry. We've all got our own idiosyncrasies. Things have upset me over the last few years, you may not even remember. I mean, I'm a great royalist. I don't give a monkey's what anybody else is. I love the royal family. And a few years ago, a fella called Michael Fagan broke into the Queen's bedroom. Did that get up my bloody nose or what? Queen's put a stop to that, by the way. She's got a fag machine outside the bedroom door now, you know. And I don't suppose you could really blame Michael Fagan. I mean, over the Queen's Beach, he's got ER, and she, you know. <laughs> yeah. What else did we have? Oh, we had the Cecil Parkinson affair four or five years ago. That bleeding upset the Liberals, didn't it, eh? 
Not for what he did, but because he'd done it with a woman. <laughs> I know it's old that now, I know it's... But do you remember that Jeremy Thorpe case? How did he bleed and get away with that? If that's British justice, well, I don't know. Do you remember the, the headlines in The Sun? The Sun headlines read between Jeremy Thorpe and Norman Scott. I cried and bit the pillar. Oh. <laughs> that had been Cyril Smith on him. He bit the bleeding mattress about him. <laughs> what else do we have? Oh, yeah. Two years ago, the Yanks bombed Colonel Gaddafi's library, burned both his books. <laughs> really upset. I only just finished colouring one of them, too, you know. <laughs> then we had the Falkland crisis. That got serious, as you know. The Italian surrender, just in case. <laughs> Good soldier them Italian, the only soldier in the Second World War to have sunburnt armpits. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the Italians have got a new tank out now with five reverse gears. <laughs> and one forward, just in case anybody comes up behind them. Organisations there go. Oh, I had my bloody share of it. And have we got any Irish in the audience tonight? Or please believe me, I'm not being political. But wherever our boys are stationed in the world, I, like many other people in this business, it's not a duty, not by a long way. I like to go and entertain them. And I often go to Ireland. And man, that is bloody frightening out there. I mean, frightening. 18, 19, 20 year old boys out there. They did the same to me, conscription, when I was a young man. Sent me to Kenya to fight mal mal terrorism. A lot of people can't even remember it. It frightened the bloody life out of me. Now we're talking about idiosyncrasies. They want me to go to Kenya to fight mal mal terrorism. I've got to have the army medical. I just cannot stand being naked in front of another man. So I'm standing in front of this army surgeon, I ain't got a stitch of clothes on. He looked me up and down, he went, um, you're an half-made small boy, aren't you? <laughs> so we've only got to fight them, haven't we? Leave him going, wait a minute. I was going home the other night, all right, I know, uh, you know, I was, I, I mean, I've, you know what, I'm, middle bloody age and I'm losing my hair and I'm bleeding it. But on the other occasion, I'll get a bit lucky. I got this bird in the back of the car the other night. Two mile round the road, there's a lay-by. Me, not what you call a mess about, a home and dry merchant. I said, right, baby, this is it. Get in the back. She went, no. I said, why not? She want to stay in the front with you. <laughs> I apologise for being a man. That's all I can do. I know what you girls think as I said, I got a bit hot under the bloody collar. Or <laughs> when it was all over, I was so bloody embarrassed. I said, I'm sorry, baby. If I'd have known you was a virgin, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> so I knew you was going to do it, I would have took me tights off. <laughs> Any one way or another, it's nice to be back here. I was in Argentina last week. I had a part-time job out there. I was president. <laughs> Week before that, I was in Belfast. You all know Belfast. Twin town with Beirut. God, what a place then. <laughs> Week before that, I was in Bradford. Anybody up in Bradford? <laughs> I felt like a spot on a domino up there. God, <laughs> you know. While I'm up there, I fancied a drink. I found this little Jewish pub called the Kosher Horses. I'm in there having a drink. Listen. In the corner of the room is a darling bird. So I walked over and hello. She went, hi there. Oh, I said, you're American. She said, I sure am. You're British. You also am British, babe. She said, as a matter of fact, my friends and myself were just discussing about the greatest lovers in the world. And we think the British man is the third greatest lover. Oh, I said, that's nice to be in the frame. I said, um, you know, like, what are you, uh, do? she went, well, I went, do you, uh, she went, no, 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 no. She said, what? I'm a lesbian. Oh, I said, that's a bloody shame. I thought that bird at the bar was smiling at me. She went, I said, well, as a lesbian, what will you do? Well, shall I go across to the bar, I'll strike up some sort of conversation, we'll go back to my place, we'll sit by the fire, and I'll start the business. <laughs> then I'll kiss all the rankles. I said, hang on a minute, bleeding, hang on. So what's the matter with you? I said, I think I'm a lesbian. <laughs> All of a sudden, the door burst open and in walks a bit of class. Now, when I say class, I mean class. Red hat, fur coat, sling back wellitons and a moustache. She is so bandy, she must have ironed her knickers over a boomerang. 
I've got the bird in the back of the motor car, I've taken it down the local lover's lane, there I'm in the back seat and I'm playing with the wobbly bits. <laughs> All of a sudden she slid around down me trousers. She said, um, what's these for? I said, for what? <laughs> we got for a walk down this lover's lane and another place was crowded, so I've stepped on the fella's back and a girl's voice went, thank you. I thought, <laughs> I'm just about to do the business. She said to me, one minute, I said, what? She went, have you got a thingy? I said, no, what? She went, have you got a letter? I said, what do you want, references? <laughs> I'm doing my best, she's just lying there. I said, what's the matter with you? She went, you know I've got a small organ. I was bleeding choked, I was. So that may be, but it's never played in a cathedral before. Jesus, it's so warm. Anybody got a cigarette by any chance? Do you mind me, I can't get down here, babe, because I'm not that bloody tall. Would you mind bringing it up here? You're a princess, thanks, babe. Bit of a liberty, but I left mine in the machine, so thank you. Yeah, good girl. Mind the ears up me trunk. <coughs> thank you very much. How old are you, babe? How old are you, darling? Yeah, 19. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <coughs> Who'd you get these off of? Ian Botham. <laughs> get, get where, get where. I wonder you can't believe another stand. Hey, get where. Yeah. I'm the bloody foreigner, aren't I? Yeah. Little flat in the west end of London. Very, very tastefully done out. Nice pink curtains, matching furniture, everything. A big noise outside this window, this occupant rushed downstairs, pushed his way through a crowd. There's a geezer laying on the floor with a big hole in him. This fellow went, oh, he said, no. Oh, he said, bloody hell, no, he said. What's happened to him? Geezer when he's dead, isn't he? Oh, he said, you soppy sausage, he said. Is that can see that? He said, who killed him? He said, I did. Oh, he said, you bloody rat bag, you bloody rat bag. What'd you kill him for? Is it because he was a puff? He said, was he? <laughs> Seen outside a house, a sign said, wanted man with strong sense of smell. This geezer knocks on the door. Fella come to the door, he said, yes. Oh, he said, I understand he wants someone with a strong sense of smell. Got a very good trunk, very good trunk. Oh, is said, come in, he said. He said, close your eyes, what's that? He went, it's an apple, wasn't it, a blue apple? Oh, is it you marvellous? Is that bloody marvellous? <laughs> Jesus. Is it close your eyes? What's that? He went, it's a nana, aren't it? I believe nana. Oh, it's that you're unbelievable, dear. Unbelievable. <laughs> I'm getting a bit too good at this, is it? Ha ha. I'm going to, yeah. He said, close your eyes. He said, he put a bottle under this fella's nose. He went, he went spark out. He woke up an hour and a half later. He said, Jesus Christ. <coughs> he said, that was strong. What was that? He said, chloroform, he said. <laughs> Makes your bum sore, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I went to the doctor's last week. He said, I ain't seen you for a long time. I said, no, you pillow could be near, wouldn't I? While I'm in, this woman comes and said, Doctor, I've got all this funny gurgling in my tummy. He said, my doctor, my man, I've been married to him for a year. The last four months, he can't do it anymore. The doctor said, whatever do you mean? He said, he just can't do it anymore. He said, you're a very lucky girl, and let me tell you why. To die and to die alone, I've had a delivery of tablets. Now, you put these tablets in whatever he's drinking. Doesn't matter what it is, tea, beer, coffee, milk, anything you like. But as soon as he's drunk it, stand back, because these work fast. Come back and see me on Wednesday. Never mind about Wednesday. Monday, the door opened so fast, you could elite your fags on the hinges. There she was. Doc Trivic, he said, did they work? He said, did they work? He was drinking coffee. I put this tablet in his coffee. No, soon he drank the coffee. He was across the table at me. Wallop, there was a cup of saucers in the air. <laughs> Under the table, across the carpet, up the stairs. It was bloody marvellous. He said, I know they work. Sorry about the cups and saucers. <laughs> so that's all right. We're not using that restaurant again. <laughs> Then this other girl come in. 
I said, Doctor, as you can see, I'm very young. As a matter of fact, I'm 15 years old. Next month, I'm 16. And the month after that, I'm getting married. But unfortunately, I don't know too much about the sex side of married life. Could you help me? Oh, he said, certainly, my dear. What do you want to know? So first of all, Doctor, the thing between my future husband's legs, the um, sexual thing, the thing, 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 what's it called? Oh, he said, there's nothing to worry about, my dear. We have a medical term for that. The medical term for that is the old chap. So thank you, Doctor, old chap. So, Doctor, on the end of the old chap, it's global. It's like a policeman's helmet, really. It's, it's <laughs> nothing to worry about, my dear. We have a medical term for that. The medical term for that is the knob. Knob, thank you. <laughs> So, Doctor, there are two round curve things about 22 inches back from the canal. What are those? He said, how far? I said, 22 inches, what are those? He said, oh, for your sake, they're the cheeks of his arse. <laughs> oh, <I've got... laughs> I have got a pal of mine who suffers desperately, and that is the only word I can find, desperately, with farmers. Farmer Giles. <laughs> Emeroids, for Christ's sake, emeroids. And he heard one of these old wives' towels, if you bung plenty of tea bags round it, it'll clear up, see? There he was with the Tetley tea bags. <laughs> dee, 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 dee. Five days later, he couldn't stand any longer. Oh, he said, Doc. Oh, he said, Doc, I've got piles. He said, have you done as a fiver? He said, no. <laughs> Doc said, we'll drop your trousers, bend over, let's have a look. My mate went, Phew. the doctor went, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. My mate went, can you see anything, Doc? Well, we said that. Uh, you're going on a long journey. <laughs> <laughs> he said, here, our son is a couple of suppositories. He said, take them home, put them in your back passage and come back and see me on Tuesday. Well, he turned up to Tuesday, doctor said, how'd you feel? Yeah. Yeah. So we ain't got a back passage, so I stuck them in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> Is it for all the good they've done? I might as well shoved them up my ass. <laughs> Three brand new babies born in a hospital. Brand new babies. One was a German baby, one was a Jewish baby, one was an Irish baby. And the nurse got mixed up. She thought, what the bloody hell am I going to do? She thought, I tried this. She went, Hail Hitler! <laughs> and the little German baby jumped up and went, <laughs> Zeke Hale! <laughs> <laughs> Little Jewish baby shit himself. <laughs> and the Irish baby shoveled it up. <laughs> House in Ireland, flames leaping up in a bloody air, and a woman appeared at the window with a baby. And the crowd went, troll the baby down. She said, I can't be killed and to be killed. Don't be a pilchard, troll the baby down. She said, I can't be killed and to be killed. Out the crowd, he said, Mrs. I am the Irish international goalkeeper. I've never dropped a ball in my life. Troll the baby down. With that, she threw the baby out the window. As the baby was coming down, there was a gust of wind. And it took the baby to one side. The goalie leapt in the air and snatched the baby from death. The crowd went raving mad. Hooray! Hooray! He bounced the baby twice and kicked it. She gets too hungry for dinner or eight, yeah. And loves the others, never goes late. She will never bother with people she hates. That's why the lady is a tramp. Ha. Doesn't like crap games, barons and earls. Won't dice in Harlem, 
dressed in ermine and pearl. She won't dis the devil, the rest of the girls. That's why, that's why, that's why, that's why she'll tramp. And loves that green grass and all the wind in her hair. Life without care. She's broke. That's so. Hates California, so cold and so damp. That's why the lady is a tramp. She loves that green grass and all that wind in her hair. Life without care. She's flat. That is that. She's all alone when she's alone with her life. That's why the lady, that's why the lady, that's why the lady is a tramp. Yes, all right. Thank you, darlings. Good night. God bless you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the incredible Mr. Mike Reed. Please put your hands together for Mr. Mike Reed. Absolutely astounding. Right across the side, my lord. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mike Reed. Come on, please put your hands together one more time, nice and loudly. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mike Reed.